I've, oh, is this on? Can you hear me? Okay. Ah, I see. I'm really sorry. I forgot that I was a chair and I was hanging out in the back of the room. <laughs> so <laughs> welcome to the third plenary talk of AJ7. Uh, it's very good. I'm happy to uh, uh, introduce uh, <coughs> uh, Dr. Reed Blaylock, uh, who is uh, here all the way from California. Uh, he's currently a Drone Site Fellow in General Education at the University of Southern California. He received uh, a PhD in Linguistics from USC uh, this year in 2022. So uh, very apt, oh, he's busy with the microphone, but <laughs> very apt for being a plenary speaker at the uh, AJL conference, I think. Uh, his research uh, examines uh, speech productions through the lens of vocal music between beatboxing, beat rhyming, and singing, among others. And yeah, while he's working on it, uh, actually, we had some uh, students interested in beatboxing and beat rhyming. So last year, uh, Masaki Fukuda, who is here, and Kosei Kimura uh, and Reed together, they were able to uh, uh, present an analysis at the Sogang University AJL about beat rhyming. And also during the pandemic, uh, when ICU students were interested, when he knew ICU students were interested in beatboxing uh, research, he gladly uh, uh, made or like uh, participated in a weekly meeting. Actually, we met almost weekly in order to uh, discuss uh, various issues related to beatboxing and linguistics, as well as uh, uh, how to and uh, make beatboxing more uh, linguistically relevant. So I think he's ready. And without further ado, let's uh, welcome uh, Dr. Blayla. I broke the microphone, but it, I'll, I'll hold it. And I, I think that works just fine. Uh, please um, uh, wave your hands vigorously if you can't hear me. Um, and also if you, uh, I, some of the things I'm going to talk about today are things that you have not heard of before. Some of those things may be linguistic and theory-based. Some of them are about beatboxing. Uh, in both cases, um, if you are having trouble following, um, I, I am a teacher. I would be happy for an interruption for a clarification um, because some of these things will be are important for, for getting down the road, and I don't want you to be lost the whole time. So uh, here we go. I was inspired uh, by Professor Barry's presentation yesterday, uh, and so I thought I would include um, an L diagram myself. Um, so so uh, we in linguistics do have a, a bunch of modules that we have inherited from uh, ideas about what language is and also what language is not, uh, and what it means to study language and what it means to study things that are not language and how those things do or more often do not interact with each other. Um, I will not be talking about the cell. I'll be talking about the phonological form area of it. Um, in, in phonology and phonetics, people who think about sound, uh, we often treat phonology and phonetics as two separate fields. Um, all of the different modules tend to get uh, uh, siloed into different fields. You study syntax, you're a syntactician, semantics, a semanticist, you're a phonologist, a morphologist, a phonetician. Um, but again, but these are these are ideologies that we have about what how language is organized. They are hypotheses, not facts. Um, don't get me wrong. There's some very good reasons to think a lot of these things. Uh, so so we people have made observations that uh, there is this dichotomy uh, which we manifest as the difference between phonology and phonetics in our studies. The difference between uh, things that are discrete and continuous, that we have this notion that there are discrete individual sounds, and yet they are produced in a continuous environment. And everything that I say here applies also to sign languages. I'm just not talking about them, but it's it's all very relevant. Uh, there, the discrete things also are abstract. You cannot find them in the acoustic signal. You cannot find them easily. 
as we often would say in the articulatory uh, stuff. Um, I actually think that's not true. And the framework I work in says that you can find these things in the articulation, uh, but that's that comes later. Uh, but but even so, the, the there are things that are abstract, it seems, that are hard to find. And we can spend years looking for acoustic cues uh, in the, that are concrete in the signal. But in the end, the, the search is often, it feels pointless sometimes. Phonological things seem time independent, uh, and they also seem context independent. So if you have, for example, um, the sound ah, the phonological representation of an ah, if you work in a system of phonemes and uh, that that does not exist in time, that ah, uh, that is a piece of information composed perhaps of phonological features, which are also bits of information, none of which exist in true actual time. You can try to incorporate time by doing something with, say, auto-segmental phonology or have timing blocks or something. You can encode time roughly in the structure, but it's not real physical time. But things that are phonetic are happening here in our analog world uh, all around us. The movements are happening in real time. And an ah sound, uh, if phonologically, we think of it as context independent. An ah is an ah is an ah. But in the messy world, of our bodies, an ah uh, will sound differently depending on its context. There's also one that doesn't get talked about quite as much, or at least I don't know if it gets talked about quite as much, uh, domain specificity and domain generality. Phonology is something that is about linguistic information. It has to do with transmitting a linguistic message. Phonetics, there's a linguistic phonetics, which is the study of how language sounds are done, but it's often uh, uh, conflated or, or mixed up by phoneticians or not or on purpose or by accident uh, with a general phonetics, the general understanding of how the physical system that is our bodies works and creates sound and signs. Uh, it's this last one, domain specificity and domain generality, that uh, I'm going to be teasing with today when we talk about beatboxing. Uh, so here we have a picture of a child blowing out some birthday candles uh, and also the sound w. Uh, Sapir in the 1933-5 paper, uh, it tries to demonstrates or talks about how these two sounds, these two actions uh, seem kind of similar. In both cases, there's probably a puckering of the lips. There's a there's a progression of air out of the mouth. Um, but where w has information that's useful. It's plus voiced, which might be different from minus voiced in some other language. Uh, it's it's labial. It's also dorsal, um, but it involves uh, uh, information of the lips. If you get rid of the lips, you may end up with a different kind of sound that has a different meaning or creates a different meaning of a word. The will can be used as a minimal pair in this sense. Um, likewise, it's plus continuant. I think I haven't used features in a long time, so I, I'm guessing it, how people would do these. Uh, it is, and this is very important, not minus birthday. There's no relationship between wu and and anything having to do with the birthday. Even if the, the phonetics were similar, which in my case they are not, uh, but perhaps for some people they are, uh, we don't in our phonological system represent non linguistic information. It's all about what is the minimal stuff, the minimal information that we can represent in order to get the manifestation of language. And this was talked about earlier today at, at I think a few different times, how one of the aims for our field often is to pare down as much as possible uh, for analytical simplicity. Um, and it's not clear whether that is a good goal for a linguist or whether that accidentally hides a lot of important information. Um, but here, we, this, is, this is my example of domain specificity. We don't care about birthdays, but maybe some other cognitive system does care about birthdays and maybe has a plus or minus birthday feature, perhaps. Who knows? Okay. So uh, here again, we have our, our dichotomy, phonology and phonetics. I work in a system uh, called articulatory phonology, where phonology and phonetics are, for our purposes, the same. Uh, it's it's a little simplistic to say that they are the same, uh, equal to each other. Uh, it is perhaps more appropriate to say that they are continuous with each other because all of the all of the different bits are still present. It's not like we don't still have observations of things that are discrete and also continuous, time independent and time dependent, but they are allowed to coexist in articulatory phonology in a very interesting way through the language of mathematical dynamical systems, which I am not going to talk to you about today. 
and uh, you're welcome. Um, the system of articulatory phonology uh, has uh, done a fairly good job, in my opinion. It's the field I work in, so I'm a little biased here. But but there's been a lot of work uh, uh, showing how movements, not movements, actions, vocal actions can encode discrete phonological information while at the same time existing in a messy, continuous physical world. Uh, and so these things that are here, these are blue boxes on the right-hand side, and these things that are in blue are things that uh, are, are fairly well established in articulatory phonology is able to be linked through dynamical systems. Uh, what I am going to talk about a bit today in terms of beatboxing, the, the overarching topic is domain specificity, because it seems... I mean, the rest of them were, it's it's hard to have discrete and continuous at the same time. How do, how can you have those things? Uh, it's also not clear, how can you have, how can you have a system that is domain specific insofar as it, it is meant to work on linguistic information, phonological information, but also domain general that it is a system that exists here in our bodies and our bodies are used for, at least mine, I use my mouth for lots of different things, eating, chewing, swallowing. I think many of you do too. Uh, and so the same pieces are used in many different ways. How do we reconcile uh, the the information with the body in, in one thing? And how do we do that in a way that uh, preserves the domain specificity of our phonological system uh, without allowing a bunch of minus birthday features? So to, to examine this a little, and um, to be clear, I do not have a, a great uh, story for you about this. That's sort of the overarching uh, uh, topic, but um, I'm not going to give you a wonderful solution for it. Uh, but we can, we can look at beatboxing, which is a vocal behavior. It's a musical behavior. It involves many different kinds of vocal articulations of the lips, the tongue, all the different bits that are used in producing the many languages of the world and their spoken forms. Uh, however, it has no linguistic content or information. Uh, so, oh, can I do that? I can. Oh, it's okay. Um, I teach a lot. I don't mind doing all the different things. So uh, this is what uh, uh, our beatbox today sounds like. Her name is Track Nine, and she sounds like this. And here's what Track Nine sounds like in a real-time MRI machine. Cool, right? I think it's very cool. Uh, I'll talk to you about those in a second. But the punchline for my research, and we, you may get a, a whiff of it today in this talk, is that uh, according to me, beatboxing and speech share phonology. Phonology is something that is not unique to language. It is something that exists. It is a type of organization that exists in beatboxing as well. Uh, notice that it's a capital P phonology, not a lowercase p phonology. Uh, beatboxers do not use, say, if you're an English-speaking beatboxer, you do not use your English language phonology. If you're a Japanese-speaking beatboxer, you do not use your Japanese phonology to do your beatboxing. Beatboxing has its own system of organization, its own phonological system, though it has some similarities to types of phonologies that we see in languages of the world, and I will try to show you that today. And I encourage your skepticism. Okay. Uh, so today's plan uh, is there's far too much to talk about, but first I'm going to uh, tell you about some of the sounds of beatboxing. Uh, this is work that was done with uh, U.S. Um, West Coast beatboxer Namisha Patil, who was responsible for collecting the videos that we're going to be looking at today in the in most cases. Um, I was brought onto the project after she collected the videos as a linguist who had some insights about how the vocal tract works. Um, and then I took it and made a dissertation about it. We're going to talk briefly about the frequency distribution of beatboxing sounds. Um, we're going to talk about beatboxing allophony and phonological harmony. Uh, and then there's uh, opportunities for beatboxing to be integrated with speech. And this touches on work that I did with Masaki-san back there and uh, uh, Kosei Kimura as well. Um, 
Uh, but I don't have pictures for them today. So, but you, many of you know who, what they look like. So that's that's enough today. Um, but uh, the the work that I'll be talking about is work um, that I did a, a little bit earlier uh, with Ramita Fulsombat, who was also a student at USC. Okay, a uh, vocabulary word for you. This is a boxeme. Uh, you may be familiar with the phoneme and the morpheme. This is a boxeme. This is not my invention. This was uh, invented by Yvain et al., a French uh, group, I think, uh, in 2019 and has been used by the French beatboxing science community. There is a beatboxing science community. We are small, but we are mighty. Uh, and they have uh, used the word boxing. Um, and so I'm, I'm I'm giving it to you today as your uh, vocabulary word. Uh, and it is a cognitive unit of beatboxing, a unit of beatboxing. And, and we hypothesize a cognitive unit of beatboxing. Um, so what are some different box themes? I'm going to show them to you using real-time MRI videos. Uh, so these slides are going to show you the sound name. Uh, as beatboxers often call them, in curly brackets, BBX notation, which is beatboxers do not have a standard notation, at least not one that covers all of the sounds of beatboxing. So these are just my dumb abbreviations, and I've called them BBX notation, and don't read too much into it. You'll get a description of the sound in terms of their voicing, airstream, place, and manner, a description of what to watch for in the vocal tract. And on the right-hand side, there is a vocal tract. Uh, and the and the vocal tract um, tells us uh, it has a nose, lips on the left hand side. There's a jaw at the bottom. The tongue is the very large octopus-like thing in the middle. Octopus arms are muscular hydrostats, just like the human tongue is. The vela moves up and down, uh, up in the upper sort of right hand corner, and the larynx uh, will enter and exit as the arytenoid cartilages close and open. Um, I will also give you the sounds on the left, and again, they're BBX notation in curly brackets, and on the right in uh, an IPA approximation. IPA is not suitable for beatboxing sounds because beatboxing sounds do not encode linguistic information, but uh, it's fun to give you IPA, and you may be able to latch onto it more in these ways. So um, here we go. Um, the, the last thing is... Uh, you may recall from a phonetics class that you have taken once upon a time that there are different ways to manipulate air within the vocal tract, lingual air streams, where the tongue body makes a closure and then moves forward or backward in order to push air. Clicks are lingual ingressive air streams. You're all welcome to make the sound, or if you'd like right now. Very nice. Uh, there's also glottalic air streams, uh, ejectives and implosives, where the larynx, the vocal folds close and the larynx moves up or down in order to move air. So you have um, ejectives like and implosives like. Uh. Go ahead. Oh, not as good as the clicks. All right, we'll work on that. And then pulmonic air stream, which is what many of us use as we are making uh, uh, speech sounds in many of our languages, air uh, exiting from the lungs and going through the vocal tract uh, to initiate sound or uh, being pulled in into the lungs through the vocal tract. Okay, here we go. Here's uh, the most common of all beatboxing sounds. It is the kick drum. It is a voiceless, glottalic, aggressive bilabial stop, which means it is a bilabial ejective. You'll see in the video complete lip closure. You'll see larynx raising during that lip closure and then release of the lip closure. Raise your hand if you saw sort of those bits in there. Let's do it again. Uh, uh, take a look for the lips in particular and the larynx. It's going to be doing some lowering and raising up in order to be like a piston and push the air out. Uh, would you all please, I do mean this sincerely, would you please make a kick drum for me? Yes, good. Uh, you will be beatboxing. You will become expert beatboxers today, uh, and you will be able to impress all of your friends and go to parties and beatbox for strangers, and they will think you're very cool. Um, so that's what our adjective looks like. We can also do a closed hi-hat. Uh, so this is a voiceless glottalic aggressive alveolar affricate rather than a bilabial closure. We have an alveolar closure. So we'll have the larynx raising just like it did before, but there will be a tongue tip closure instead. instead. Uh, I should mention the MRI videos. Um, if you've ever been in an MRI, you know that it's rather loud. It makes a, a jump, 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 jump kind of sound. Uh, so the videos sound uh, as as 
muffled as they do uh, because we had to reconstruct the noise of the beatboxer from from inside the loud ambient noise. Um, but so this is a, a basic uh, alveolar ejective. Here's what it looks like. Oh, here's what it looks like. Gozo. I don't know if that's how you use dozo, but I thought I would give it a try. Uh, so we have, uh, we could do it as a little Africa here with a tie bar. Um, notice, by the way, that we have our kick drum and our closed hi-hat. They only differ by one thing. One has a labial closure, one has an alveolar closure, but otherwise they're the same, but they make very different sounds. Um, could you all please, you've made great closed hi-hats, could you please um, do um, uh, the following sequence? That's good. Good. And then, no, I didn't give you that one yet. Never mind. That'll come later, maybe. Uh, we have an inward case snare. An inward case snare refers to a voiceless pulmonic ingressive velar affricate with a lateral palatal release. This one's a little harder. Um, so there's going to be a full velar closure. The tongue body is going to close uh, up here by the velum. And then the tongue body is going to shift forward. And as it does, you'll notice that the tongue body does not move away from the palate. That tells us, this is a mid-sagittal view of the vocal tract, that tells us that if air is flowing, it's flowing along the sides of the tongue, so it's lateral. And beatboxers tell us, uh, you can't see what direction air is flowing here, but beatboxers tell us that this sound is an inward sound, which means that it's pulmonic ingressive, air flowing from the outside world into the lungs. It looks like this. Feel free to give it a try. My inward case scenario is not so good. So if you have a good one, that's that's very impressive. Um, so we have two glottalic egressive sounds, one pulmonic ingressive sound. Uh, this one uh, is a little bit harder to do with just the International Phonetic Alphabet. But uh, if we borrow from the extensions to the IPA, which are used for uh, speech disorders, uh, pathologies, and other kinds of sounds, um, it's a it's systematic. It's it's been agreed on by people. Uh, then we can pull. Um, it's a lambda or maybe a backwards lambda with a little loop through it, um, and that is the symbol from the extension to the IPA for uh, uh, voiceless lateral fricative. And then the downward arrow. I've seen some people today use a downward arrow to indicate low tone uh, or, or maybe down step. Um, to here today it uh, refers to pulmonic ingressive. That's how it's used on the extensions to the IPA. So that's how we use it here too. One more. This is a spit snare. You've seen two glottalic sounds, one pulmonic sound. This is now a lingual sound. It's a voiceless lingual egressive bilabial affricate. Um, if you uh, play an instrument that, uh, and you've learned how to circular breathe with your instrument, uh, a lingual airstream like this is uh, essentially circular breathing, except that your instrument is you and you're not actually circular breathing, but the tongue movement is the same. It's like spitting through a straw instead of sucking through a straw. Uh, so there will be a full tongue body closure against the velum, uh, as well as a labial closure. And uh, you'll see I say lingually aggressive, but in this case, the, the jaw is lifting and the tongue body is moving forward a little bit, um, but the cheeks are puffing out a little bit and, and the air is getting uh, squeezed through the lips and it makes a very distinctive snare clapping sound, which I cannot make very well. Give it a try if you want. Somebody, Masaki's got it. Thank you. That's what it's supposed to sound like. Uh, you can all try. Uh, you can at least do the kick drum and the closed hi hat, and those two sounds can get you a lot of different beat patterns. You just mix them around rhythmically, and, and you get something fun. I could spend all day uh, talking to you about different beatboxing sounds, and in the past I have done that, but then I ran out of time for everything else. So if you would like to know more about beatboxing sounds, uh, I have a website that you can refer to. Um, the spit snare looks like this in the IPA. It's a reverse click. The arrow going up indicates a lingual egressive reverse click. Yes, I've already spent too much time on this, but uh, you need to know what the sounds are in order to know everything else that's going on. So one question we could look at uh, is, 
So, so the rest of the beatboxing science community has posited that boxeme, remember your vocabulary word boxeme, that's analogous to a phoneme. It's a phonological unit of beatboxing sound. And if you looked, at, if, you were, if you were paying attention, you may have noticed that all of the beatboxing sounds we saw just now look an awful lot like segments, segment-sized units. Um, it was either a single symbol from the IPA or we could use a tie bar to indicate that it was all one sort of construct. And many beatboxing sounds seem akin to phonological segments in some way, but it's not clear that they should be uh, phonological segments. Beatboxing sounds have musical meaning. There are snares, kicks. They're organized in a way that is not completely meaningless. They, the beatboxing sounds have roles that conditions where they can appear in a musical structure. So uh, the, the first thing to do is to uh, assert that the beatboxing sounds, the box seams are morphological, or if not morphological in the linguistic sense, then at least morphological in a beatboxing sense. The box seams have some meaning. And I'm going to give you the least convincing uh, data argument that I can, which is uh, to show you the distribution of beatboxing sounds and how it resembles the distribution of uh, speech words. So this is uh, the top 100 uh, most frequent words from my dissertation. Uh, as if you know about how this works, Zipf's law um, is, is what we're looking at here. Uh, we have the most frequent word is the English word the, followed by of, a, and, in, to, is. Uh, we have lots of function words. Uh, we have, we have um, very important uh, words that do very important jobs and are very small. Beatboxing is the, I think, eighth most common word in my dissertation, which makes sense. It's about beatboxing. Um, and so we're looking at here uh, that the, the vast majority of words in many corpora are these small little words, and, and you only need a few words uh, to handle most of the words that are in a uh, corpus. Some people call it the 80-20 rule, that 80% of the frequency of all the words is taken up by only 20% of the words, or sometimes less. It depends on your law. Um, Zipf's law it says that there's a very particular frequency relationship that the first most common word uh, is, I should say this way, that the, the second most common word is half as frequent as the first most common word. The third most common word is one third as frequent as the first most common word. The fourth is one fourth. The fifth is one fifth and so on. And if you plot that relationship, it looks like this yellow line. And it's it's a pretty it's it's decent. Uh, it underreports some of the middle ones, but that's all right. In my beatboxing data set, I counted all of the beatboxing sounds that were used across forty four different what are called beat patterns, beatboxing utterances. And it turns out that the beatboxing sounds do a really good job of following Zipf's law. Uh, the The frequency distribution of the sounds uh, is matches the characteristic we expect from words in a corpus. Now, many things in the world follow this kind of relationship, this kind of power law, so so we should not be surprised, I suppose. Uh, if you know anything about a power law, you'll know that you should expect this as much as anything else in the world. Uh, whether uh, This does not mean that beatboxing sounds are just like speech words, but it is a suspicious coincidence, we could say. Uh, and and future work uh, that the beatboxing science community needs to do is to work out what beatboxing sound meanings are, but the meanings of musical things are hard to suss out, so it's it's complicated. But if you'll go with me and say that the box seams are morphological units, then that means we have an opening to look for within the organization of the beatboxing sounds, some kind of phonology. And the first uh, one we can look at is allophony. Allophony, uh, phonemes and allophones, allophony. Allophony refers to productive, context-dependent sound distributions. Your ability to, uh, for a given phoneme, predict how it will manifest in a particular speech utterance based on the sounds around it. Um, the phonological rules are often written as A arrow B in the environment of C underscore D. Some sound becomes some other sound in some phonological environment. For example, in US English, a uh, vowel becomes a nasalized vowel before a nasal consonant. We can write that as a rule um, such as this. The uh, phonemic vowel becomes an allophonic nasalized vowel uh, before something that's plus nasal. So, for example, in the word pan, uh, we have p, a, and n, 
and the ah comes before a nasal n, mm, and so the ah becomes nasalized. Great. Okay. Uh, I told you that I was going to be working in articulatory phonology where uh, we don't think of the sounds quite in the same way. Here's how we might look at it in articulatory phonology. We might say that uh, there's a vocal action, a cognitive phonological unit, a vocal action for a bilabial closure corresponding to the bilabial closure of a p. This is roughly adjacent to the plus labial aspect of a p and the minus continuant aspect because it's a full labial closure, but features aren't real here. Um, there's also uh, a palatal constriction. This is the tongue body moving toward the palate, but it's rather low. It's a wide constriction, uh, and it makes the, it, it contributes to the ah sound. And then there are two gestures, two actions required for the n. Mm. There's an alveolar closure because the tongue tip has to go toward the alveolar ridge, and the velum has to lower in order for air to go into the nasal passages. And all these things are phonologically salient. These are these are phonological units of information. Uh, that a person uh, can reorganize productively in different ways. Um, and in a different slide, in a different presentation, I have a bunch of slides to show you how that can be done, but not today. For allophony, oh, um, notice that all these things are happening across time. Uh, so the, the bilabial closure of the p and the, and the tongue body constriction for the a begins simultaneously in English, and this is what the data suggests, that if you look inside the vocal tract using MRI or EMMA or other types of uh, articulatory imaging, you find that in many cases the tongue body begins while the lips are also closing. It takes a little bit longer for the tongue body to reach its destination, but it generally gets there before the bilabial closure for the put is done. And this is what gives us formant transitions. This is what gives us all the beautiful pieces of pieces of core articulation that exist that make sound so apparently messy. In our case, if we just hone in on the time during which the velum is lowered and the palatal constriction for the vowel is active, we see that just simply by the organization of how the how the different gestures, how the different actions are coordinated, we end up with some portion of the vowel is nasalized, is produced while the velum is low, hence a nasalized vowel. And different speakers uh, have different amounts of variation on, on how often they will nasalize how much of the vowel. This can be accent dependent, this can be language dependent, uh, but this is phonological knowledge that a speaker has of when to begin lowering the velum in order to uh, make a nasalized vowel. So the nasalized vowel here, it's not a phonological, you don't need a phonological computation to get the nasalized vowel, it just happens because that's how the sound, that's how the movements are organized. So that's a case of allophony for speech. For beatboxing, we can take a look at, we had our forced kick drum. Forced kick drum, can you all, can you all do the, um, again? That's your... Is your kick drum. Uh, there's also an unforced kick drum, which is a lingual airstream instead of a, a glottalic airstream. So we can make a box around the lips to show that the lips are both moving. Um, and uh, the forced kick drum, uh, it's an injective, so the larynx is active. It's going to raise up to push air out of the vocal tract. Uh, but the unforced kick drum does not have any larynx activity. The unforced kick drum has tongue body activity. So the tongue body is going to make a closure against the velum, but in the kick drum that you saw before, it does not. You learned the forced kick drum. Now I'm showing you it's allophone, the unforced kick drum. Uh, so we can see for the, un for the forced kick drum, labial closure, larynx movement, no tongue body closure. Let's do it again. For the unforced kick drum, labial closure again, but there's a tongue body closure and no laryngeal movement. It's a little faster because it came out of a, out of a different context. If we're going to look at this from an articulatory phonology perspective, we can lay out again what are the different relevant uh, actions for these sounds. So if you're looking at a forced kick drum, the one that you saw before, you have a bilabial closure during which there's a laryngeal closure and raising action. These are organized in time in a way something like this. These are schematics. If we toss in something like the spit snare that you learn, which is a lingual egressive sound where the tongue body makes a closure and that manipulates the flow of air as well, 
Well, that tongue body closure co-occurs with some of the other closures for a nearby kick drum, and uh, it can cover up the. It, it can it can co-occur. The tongue body closure will co-occur during, say, what would have been the laryngeal closure I'm raising, and may also occur during some of what's the bilabial closure for the kick drum. So you have an intention to perform a kick drum, and then you also have an intention to perform a spit snare, both of which in this case happen to require bilabial closures, one of which requires a velar closure, the spit snare. And if the tongue body closure begins early enough, then the laryngeal closure will disappear and you end up with an unforced kick drum. You have the intention to perform a forced kick drum, but the result is instead an unforced kick drum. This is, again, overlap. The temporal overlap of the different actions has caused a qualitative change in the sound. Before it was nasalization of a vowel, here it's a change from what people doctors call a forced ejective sound to an unforced lingual sound. I thought I had something to add, but I don't. So we could write that as uh, as a rule like this. Uh, uh, the forced kick drum, which is a capital B, becomes an unforced kick drum, lowercase b, near tongue body sounds. And it turns out that this type of rule occurs for many other kinds of beatboxing sounds too. Any glottalic, e uh, uh, glottalic egressive sound uh, will undergo something similar in the data set that I have. Uh, so we could say there's a general rule, uh, there's a conspiracy, where glottalic aggressive sounds become unforced, get adopt a tongue body closure when they're near a tongue body closure sound. And this is just a natural consequence of overlap of articulations. Okay, let's, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing some yawns, it's late in the day, let's level this up a little bit. Let's take a look at a whole case of phonological harmony. So uh, we have from Tuyuka, we have the case of uh, the word mipi, which means nothing. But if you uh, use uh, phonological harmony and extend uh, a nasalization from the beginning of the word through the rest of the word, you get the word badger. We were just talking about the word bat. What's the word in badger in Japanese? We talked about it yesterday, I forget. We can come back to it. I just like to connect things that are happening in the talk to things that are happening in the world around us. So that's, we'll, we'll, we'll don't spend time thinking about badgers now. We'll come back to it. The badger is not important. What the important thing is the phonological harmony that we have this spreading of the nasality from the M here. From an articulatory phonology, you could do this with autosegmental phonology. You could have a plus nasal gesture on the M, which spreads at lengths one by one, segment by segment to the other things. And that's fine. Um, if you know that, great. If you don't, it doesn't matter because we're going to do it the articulatory phonology way, which is that we're going to start with a labial closure and a velum lowering for the mm sound. It's a nasal sound, so the velum has to be low, and it's a bilabial sound, so the lips have to be closed. We have a tongue body closure for the e. Uh, this is another palatal constriction, but it's going to be higher in the vocal tract, so that's so it gets an e instead of an a. Uh, and notice again, I've just schematically made it so that the uh, E and the other, um, the velum and the uh, lip closures actions uh, start at the same time. Uh, we can also do the P in MIPI, uh, and we can start those uh, here at the beginning of the next syllable and have another palatal closure. Uh, now, again, this means nothing unless it's nasalized. We could copy the velum lowering action across two or three times, depending on whether or not you think that the P is also nasalized. Uh, but that seems a little over the top. So instead, we're just going to extend the velum lowering gesture throughout the entire word. One long action instead of three or four separate actions, which there's no evidence for. So the extension is a true temporal extension. Rather than doing a, a not real-time linking of things, uh, we have actual in real-time extending of the gesture. And this is what we find. We don't have too many um, articulatory studies of phonological harmony, but when we do have them, we tend to find that this is what happens. For this kind of local vowel consonant harmony, not like long-distance consonant harmony, which is a different beast entirely, but for this kind of harmony, you tend to find that whatever the harmonizing feature is, uh, it's some uh, articulation that is being stretched throughout its domain. I've given little um, yellow bars on the end to indicate that this is a special gesture, a special action that does this kind of extension. 
Uh, and so the nasalization is just like we saw before in the case of pan, where uh, it's caused by velum lowering overlapping with the vowel when you just have vowel present. That's how we detect the nasalization is occurring. Phonological harmony. Uh, in beatboxing, we see it with, uh, and just like I gave you a vowel nasalization case, here's, uh, we for beatboxing, we're using a tongue body overlap. We're going to see it again for the phonological harmony. So uh, this is um, a beat pattern which features uh, only, only sounds that uh, we have evidence for being allophones of their original, say, glottalic, egressive, phonemes, if you'd like to use phonemes. Um, so we have uh, our friend lowercase b on the left and as the first sound, which is the unforced kick drum, the tongue body closure kick drum, not the not the stronger, that's the adjective that you learned. And the other sounds uh, are all the same way, except for one, which is the spit snare, which is the two s's here in the BBX notation. Um, so pay note that, we'll come back to it. For now, uh, I'm going to show the same video. I'm going to show it side by side. The purple box over the left video uh, uh, highlights what's being blown up on the right hand side, which is uh, uh, the velum and the tongue body, which currently is down here in the lower left hand corner. The velum is uh, the little bit of tissue that's going through the middle. And we're going to see that in this video, the tongue body makes a closure against the velum and stays there for the entire video, for the entire pattern. Here's how it looks. Did you see it? Do you want to see it again? Yeah, okay. I'm very proud of this slide because I got all the timing to work out. It's not something easy to do in PowerPoint. Uh, the tongue body stays elevated the whole time. But, oh, there's only one sound that really has a tongue body closure gesture in there or tongue body closure action. It's that spit snare. It's the only one that is that, that definitely, definitively has a tongue body closure. And so we can model this as the tongue body closure of the spit snare, which is on the right extending leftward in its domain and also rightward, but in this example, left, and covering up the other bilabial closures, uh, uh, temporarily extending through the other bilabial closures, and in the process, wiping out the laryngeal closures and raising, which I can talk about more in a second. Um, but so we have, once again, an extended action, a phonological unit of beatboxing, which is being extended temporally and causing the allophony that we saw before, but this time over a longer distance in vowel consonant harmony. Now, uh, if you have studied phonological harmony, then you are likely familiar with the notion that harmony typically in languages has triggers and undergoers. There are sounds that cause the harmony, and these are typically classes of sounds. So for a language that has, say, nasal harmony, you probably have a nasal sound. Thank you. How, what does that mean? Five minutes? Okay. Okay. So you typically have a, a nasal sound uh, that is triggering the harmony. Um, and the undergoers are non-nasal sounds, which are adopting nasality. And sometimes there are phonological blockers, which are sounds that may stop the harmony from spreading. In beatboxing, these are the same three types of airstreams that I sneakily introduced to you earlier. So lingual airstream, glottalic airstream, and pulmonic airstream all have different roles in the phonological harmony process. So in the example that you saw before, the spit snare was the uh, was the unit that's the trigger of harmony. It's the only sound that doesn't seem to be an allophone of something else. And it's also the only sound that definitely has a tongue body closure action. But in the data set that I have, there were seven different examples of beatboxing tongue body closure harmony patterns, we can call them, where it's the same kind of tongue body closure uh, active throughout the entire utterance. And uh, it was caused by, by seven different sounds, all of which are very different in nature. They do not belong to the same musical class. They are not made by the same types of articulations, except that they all share the tongue body closure action. They have nothing in common, in fact, except for the tongue body closure action. So we have a click roll. 
I'm not going to give you full definitions of them, but I'm just going to show them to you and you can you can verify for yourself. They all have tongue body closures. This is them produced in their isolated form. There's a sound effect that I have a I don't have a good label for. A lip roll. A spit snare, which you saw before. Then two different kinds of water drop sound effects. And all, I hope you will agree, tongue body closure sounds. The tongue body is closed up against the velum. And these are the only sounds that could possibly have been triggers of harmony. And all of them were triggers of tongue body closure harmony in the beatboxing patterns where they existed. None of them ever appeared and didn't trigger harmony. So there's, we have a, a whole class of lingual airstream sounds, which are triggers of phonological harmony. And you have already seen that uh, there is a tendency for glottalic egressive so sounds, uh, the, the kick drum, which you saw before, the closed hi-hat as well, and some other sounds. They all near tongue body closures, which is the case of our harmony, adopt tongue body closures. All these glottalic egressive sounds are undergoers of the harmony. And I will not uh, really tell you anything about this except to say that it happens to be 60% um, probably true in my analysis that pulmonic airstream sounds uh, also block phonological harmony, stopping it from spreading through its domain. Uh, and this is because if you are going to breathe out or breathe in through the mouth, you cannot have your tongue body also being closed in your mouth because that will stop the flow of air. So um, breathing is a survival thing that tends to be more important than making a tongue body closure sound. So uh, uh, the pulmonic sounds win uh, and, and beat the other ones. Okay, uh, so those are the uh, we have a whole class system uh, for a phonological analysis uh, that fits, I think, very nicely, and perhaps you'll agree or even better disagree uh, with a phonological harmony analysis for beatboxing. And uh, I never have time, but I'm going to try anyway very quickly to tell you about this one last thing before I get my double bell. Uh, this is a behavior called beat rhyming. It's the combination of beatboxing and singing simultaneously. Uh, it sounds, hmm, you know what? It works like this. Uh, you have words. Uh, in this case, the phrase baby got me floating. It continues. on that snare. It doesn't matter what else is going on. You must uh, make your replacement there. Um, there's a conspiracy about this. You can do it not to matter. Oh, 
Okay. Hello. So in this kind of case, uh, you have the word sky from the same uh, performance. And the word sky uh, is being produced with a uh, case snare, uh, a, a, a velar uh, affricate sound in the middle of a vowel. It sounds like this. That's with my head in the clouds and my feet in the sky. I hear it one more time. Okay, so in Prat, that can be annotated. We have a s, a k, and then we get a little bit of a vowel, just a little bit, before there's a closure. Now, uh, if we take a, try to do this using phonemes and allophones, it's very difficult because you can't really split a phoneme in half. That's not allowed. When I show this slide to my wife, she gets um, uncomfortable because you just can't do that. You can't split those sounds in that way. Um, we could imagine that maybe there's two, maybe it, it, it doubles itself, uh, but the word sky in English does not have two ahs in it, so that would be changing the phonological makeup of the sound, which also seems wrong. We could imagine maybe it's a Q-theory situation where the ah uh actually has three spots in it, and the first and the third are ah, uh, and the middle is an inward case snare, but that also seems wrong because you want those things to be like uh, uh, parts of component parts, not whole pieces. Uh, so ultimately, it's very difficult to uh, to find a good phonological analysis using uh, phonemes and allophones for how this works. But we can use the strategy of gestural scores. And thank you. This is the last thing. We can use the strategy of gestural scores uh, and 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 use the same types of actions to combine speech and beatboxing actions in one utterance. You just take the relevant speech actions that make up the word sky, a s, a k, both of them have a spread glottis because they're voiceless, so the the, the aspiration part, uh, and then the, the tongue body constriction for the i diphthong. And while that goes on, you also have uh, the relevant beatboxing actions for the inward case snare, which you all sort of learned how to do. And you uh, have them all timed, and uh, the case snare takes over for a moment because it's very important, and then it gives control of the uh, speech articulators back to the mouth. And that works in articulatory phonology in a way that uh, trying to split up a sound doesn't work in uh, a symbol-based system, at least not as far as I know. So the punchline again, beatboxing and speech uh, share phonology here in the sense that they both can exhibit things like allophony and harmony, uh, depending on the system and the beatboxer and the person. There are many phonological traits that these systems have, uh, and we could talk about phonological contrast and some other things as well. All Everything that I can find seems to be there in beatboxing as well as in speech, even though the phonologies themselves are not like identical in their, in their content, but their form is the same. That's the end of me talking. Thank you very much. We have uh, Olivia, yeah, about 10 minutes, or oh, five, six minutes for question or comments. Sorry about that. Hi, um, I really enjoyed this talk. It was, it was really, really interesting. Thank you so much. I just had a quick question about the, um, the forced and unforced uh, kick yes. drum? Yes. Uh-huh. So the force would be something like, right? Uh, maybe. Yeah. So, um... I'm going so, back to it, but go ahead. But when the velum lowers, when the velum lowers, then the forced kick drum becomes an unforced kick drum. It's not about the velum per se, uh, that the velum is relevant. Um... Uh, it's it's about the tongue body. Um, okay. The velum doesn't have to lower for the tongue body to make a closure to it, but that is often what happens. Right. Yeah. So I guess my question would be like trying to link it to like um, phonemic contrast in phonology, right? So when beatboxers think of a kick, do they differentiate between a forced kick drum and an unforced kick drum the way we would um, think of phonemic contrast between phonemes? No. So these are allophones. These are allophones. Okay. 
that, that was what I was yeah. wondering. Yeah. So there, there is no situation where they would intentionally want to um, produce a unforced. Uh, now that's a different question. Uh, so, so in terms of the analysis, in terms of the distribution of the sounds, how they actually work, definitely allophones. But beatboxers, like linguists, are highly aware of their vocal situation. They have to be in order to learn how to do the sounds and do them properly. And so there's a lot more intention uh, and attention paid to what the sounds are. So you will find beatboxers instructing each other, oh, no, this has to be unforced here. Or unforced is sometimes called a humming kick. If you want to try to vocalize something at the same time, oh, you have to do your humming kick here. Uh, and then the beatboxers can say, oh, yes, of course. And then they'll change from their forced kick to their humming kick, um, which, which again is the same. Uh, so they do have some overt knowledge of it. It's true. But if you, when I have asked beatboxers to uh, do a humming pattern and they do their kick drums and I say, what was that first sound? They'll say, it's a kick drum. And I'm like, oh, was it a forced or an unforced kick drum? And they'll say, oh, I'm not sure. I don't know. And then, the, and then we realize that, oh, there's a little bit of a laugh in there. Um, so it typically... Even though they had some awareness of it, the patterning is allophonic. Great. Thank you. Yeah, that, that was my question. Yeah. Just a comment. Uh, the pattern that you showed in Sky, I think uh, in uh, like Zapotec or Panoan languages in Peru, they have this re-articulated glottal stop. So they have a R vowel, but in the middle, they have a glottal stop suddenly. So uh, those kind of sounds are very difficult to describe using IPA system because it's really just a single vowel R, but it's R, 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 and the speakers are pretty consistent about that. So that sound pattern, uh, the sky yeah, 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 discussion yeah. where the kick drum was going in there, it's possible even in human language uh, yeah. uh, if you look at them. So. There is another parallel that uh, you can actually do. Thank you. And the representational system, as you said, cannot actually capture that kind of sound production. And that's a non-musical system? That's it's, just... Not music. it's just one of the uh, glottal laryngeal category that they use, like brassy, creaky, and re-articulated. Ah. That's what they call it in Zapotec. Excellent. Literature. I will be hitting you up for citations later. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just building on that, actually, what it reminded me of was um, in uh, sign language phonology. Mm. Where you mm -hmm. have. Um, so it seems to me that it's just like a further analogy that uh, mm -hmm. a phonology of beatboxing is, well, more like this phonology of signed languages, Excellent. but you know, also... Great, thank you. Um, you can hear me, right? I can. Okay, so on, on the topic of like representation of sounds, I noticed uh, if you go say to, I think 42, slide 42 by chance. Um, where are we at? Yeah, here. So on the, the lower part of the screen, we have a a melody, I suppose, of sorts, or like a beat pattern, sure. if you will. Beat pattern. I don't know what the beat pattern. Yeah. Okay, so I thought that it's interesting that you represent it like that because it it kind of mimics how we represent language through, uh, you know, a system like IPA in that we're writing it on one 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 chord or writing mm -hmm. like the as close as possible the representations of sounds using these these graphemes. Mm -hmm. right? uh, but as I was thinking a little bit about it, you know, if you were producing a song on like uh, a drum machine, for example, you would have multiple tracks, one with like uh, the snare and one with the hi-hat and then one with the kick drum, et cetera, and whatnot. So, I mean, it, on the one hand, it makes perfect sense because, you know, you're much more limited in the number of sounds you can produce with just one mouth, right? You can't, you can't have like a... Sh don't tell, don't tell that to a beatboxer. Where you, sorry? Don't tell that to a beatboxer. Well, yeah, so that I'm getting to the point because yeah. I want to know a little more, more about that. But in, in my mind, you know, as someone who doesn't know anything about beatboxing, you can't have, you can't articulate multiple sounds at once. Mm -hmm. So I thought it, it was, uh, it made sense to represent it like this. But 
the second part to to this comment slash question is that uh, are there strategies to uh, uh, deliberately manipulate airstream mechanisms to approach or otherwise produce multiple uh, sounds at the same time? So if you think of like if you think of it in like traditional kind of like music or like yeah music theory, like if you are a, a house beat or whatever, you're going to have like a kick drum on every every uh, fourth beat, and then you're going to have like uh, a snare and then followed by like a hi-hat or whatever, but those, they will line up, right? So producing those two sounds at the same time, what kind of strategies do beatboxers have articulatory? These are two great things. The answer to the first one is, uh, I believe that the notation system for the drums that you're referring to some, sometimes called a drum tab or a drum tablature, uh, and that is how I typically annotate beatboxing um, because you kind of have to. Um, this is this type of notation is a is a convenience for us to be able to sort of when it is linear to follow it along. Um, but in some of the other harmony situations, the harmony uh, uh, is co-occurs with. It's very common in beatboxing to get humming while beatboxing or doing an inward bass kind of sound uh, or other sounds reminiscent of heavy metal growling or uh, throat singing at the same time. So you do get these kinds of. Uh, uh, extended basses or or intermittent uh, uh, glottal or laryngeal sounds co-occurring thanks to the magic of lingual airstreams with other more percussive sounds in the front. And so that is something beatboxers uh, work hard to be able to do reliably so that your lingual airstream sounds sound just as punchy as your glottalic airstream sounds to get the coordination so you can do those nice uh, laryngeal basses and everything else at the same time. and the fact that it's possible means that the notation system for beatboxing is much more complicated than the notation system for many languages. And so beatboxers have not yet agreed on consistent notation systems uh, that represent the rhythm as well as what the sounds are and how they are co-occurring. Um, so I have my own system that I've used and which I have forced Masaki and Kosei into using um, in some different ways. Um, and But it definitely requires that kind of uh, uh, time and overlap availability in it. Thank you. I think I think that's the end of the time, right? Okay. Thank you for the answer. Ms. Alp, I suggest that uh, you ask a lot of questions on using Slack. <laughs> so let's uh, thank uh, Reed one more time. Thank you so much. Sure.